Hello to all the participants. I can see that we have uh, around 120 attendees currently in the session. Uh, we have all our panelists also ready to go. Um, and thank you from people across the world from joining. I see we have uh, people right from the South Pacific, across Asia and uh, Africa and even the US and Americas where it would be really early in the morning. So good afternoon, good evening and a very early good morning to some of the participants. Uh, the format that we will follow is I'll just give a short uh, introduction about uh, the topic and then uh, each of the panelists will speak uh, to talk about what they are doing in their companies as well as the sector and the geography in which they are operating and how they are coping uh, with the COVID-19 situation. And then at the end, uh, in the second half of the discussions, we will take questions from you. So please feel free to keep sending across your questions in the chat uh, chat box section and uh, we will keep collating them and put them, put them to the panelists at the end. Okay, so uh, I'll just start off with a brief introduction. So the digital lending landscape has been pretty vibrant uh, in the last uh, eight to 10 years. Uh, based on some uh, research and uh, data that we could dig up, there are at least 82 countries where there is a specific digital uh, lending provider. And I'm not talking about traditional institutions la launching a digital product. These are end-to-end -end, uh, digital companies who are doing digital credit in a uh, purely, uh, purely electronic and digital manner. So there's uh, upwards of US $10 billion invested. We have had sector unicorns and IPOs as well. And the model has also gone through multiple iterations and multiple uh, revisions. And we see there are P2P lenders, SME, MSME lenders. A lot of Africa is trying uh, models based on small ticket loans uh, on phones. And what's interesting is also that the portfolio size of these companies in terms of uh, lending amount, number of customers has seen a really strong growth over the past uh, couple of years. As I have indicated, they have uh, most of, on an average, the sector has recorded over 50% growth. Now, why are we holding this webinar? As you all know, most of you are uh, operating from countries which are seeing various degrees of lockdowns and uh, movement curtailment and restrictions. This obviously has brought the economic activity to a hold or a trickle and has impacted the digital lenders also, them being equal participants and uh, members in the economic ecosystem. So, uh, however, some issues are very specific to digital lenders. They operate on a low touch model. Many of them cater to SME and MSME segments or mom and pop shops whose businesses have almost ground to a halt. So there's an added risk on these portfolios what will happen in the emerging post-COVID scenario, how do institutions cope currently, how can they help their customers uh, go through this crisis, are the issues we are looking at. Also, many of the digital lenders are very young companies. Uh, they are lesser than five years old, sometimes even lesser than one or two years old. And they are facing this once in a lifetime unprecedented crisis very early in their life cycle. So it's doubly important for them to tread this path very carefully. And this webinar is organized to look at this emerging and really a sunrise sector within the fintech ecosystem of how it is coping uh, with the COVID-19 situation, the economic challenges that are coming along with it, and how can knowledge sharing and views exchange on this webinar help the sector go forward. A few of the issues that will be discussed uh, by the panelists is obviously the business continuity, as I mentioned in the lockdown situation. How are they managing uh, liquidity and cash flows in such a scenario where they have to keep the business going? Uh, there is also an aspect of regulatory forbearance. Some countries like India and to an extent China and others have already announced some regulatory forbearance for loan customers. Others are thinking about that. So some uh, of the providers are already in the process of giving and extending those forbearance norms uh, to their customers and others are advocating with their regulators for such. So that's another aspect to look at. 
uh, then there is uh, client support and uh, keeping the communication lines open, particularly in the current scenario where uh, the digital lenders generally operate in a low touch environment. Their, their means of communication is mostly through electronic and digital means. So how do you keep in touch with the customer in, in particularly in scenarios where low, no repayments are happening, where there's a moratorium or a complete lockdown? What do providers do in such a scenario? Also, as I mentioned, ideas around uh, and innovations which providers are uh, doing, uh, startups, fintechs, what are they doing to cope with the situation? And lastly, many of the providers in our interactions and in our knowledge have also gone back to their funders uh, to look at how they can redeploy capital better, secure emergency lines of funding and various other things. So our panelists will also comment upon that uh, through the discussions. Uh, the format that I mentioned is as follows. Alok will be our first panelist who will speak, followed by Lloyd. They, will, they are from the sector. They both operate. Uh, digital lending institutions, so they will throw light both from an Asia and a country respective India and Cambodia perspective about how the ecosystem and how their respective companies are coping. Then we have Jagdish from uh, Vaya Finser. Vaya has been doing a lot of work around uh, enabling a traditional microfinance model through digital mechanisms. So Jagdish will uh, detail more about that and how that model is getting impacted. Uh, Sakshi and uh, Jaspreet, Sakshi from GSMA and Jaspreet from uh, UNCDF will take a more uh, wider Asia view and a sector view. Sakshi will comment more specifically from the mobile money piece, particularly in Africa and a few Asian countries. Mobile money has been at the forefront of extending small ticket size credit products. How is that sector coping? And then Jaspreet. Uh, through the UN mechanism has been hand-holding a lot of startups, funders. They have conducted multiple uh, uh, incubation and accelerator programs. So Jaspreet will give a view of how this young se sector and how the young startups in this ecosystem are responding and how the funders are looking at uh, helping them try toward this crisis. As I said earlier, please keep shooting across your questions in the chat box. Uh, we will collate it and the second half about 30 to 40 minutes at the end is purely dedicated to your questions and we'll put it to the various uh, panelists right so we'll get started off uh, i'll request uh, all the panelists to uh, switch on their uh, video feeds Alok, uh, you're there? Yes, can you hear me? Okay, so Alok, please uh, go ahead uh, with, the, with what's your view on the sector and how do you see Indify coping with the current scenario? Sure, uh, thank you, Achan. Uh, and thanks everyone for joining in. Uh, you know, Indify is a platform for small business lending. Uh, we typically lend to micro and small uh, SMEs, average ticket size of four to five lakh rupees. Uh, and we operate both as a marketplace platform uh, as well as an NBFC entity through which we invest off our own balance sheet. Uh, so roughly 60% of the capital that we deploy today is on our own balance sheet and 40% is other lenders who use our platform uh, to reach out to these small businesses. Uh, as this uh, you know, crisis started to materialize, there are really three or four lines of response that we have uh, implemented so far. The first one has been to uh, you know, assess the impact that this has on our customers uh, in a fairly granular manner, right? So we operate across uh, different industry sectors. We have got uh, you know, travel agencies at one hand, which are very uh, highly compromised in this situation. We've got restaurants uh, and at the other end, we will have e-commerce companies and then grocery and pharma retailers uh, in our customer base. Uh, and it's important for us to understand how their business will get affected in order to be able to translate that impact on our business, as well as uh, understand how we can be helpful uh, to our customers in these times. So what we did is uh, to look at impact of various disruptions um, on, on these businesses. You know, the first one, which is uh, of immediate relevance, of course, is the physical disruption around lockdowns. Uh, you know, there is a more sustained uh, 
demand disruption that we are anticipating and that varies from segment to segment that even when the lockdowns get lifted our customers going to come back in equal numbers uh, or not and that is very often a function of discretionary versus non discretionary spends the size of the ticket uh, that customers normally spend uh, things of that nature uh, there is potentially a supply chain impact on many of these companies uh, depending on what goods uh, or services were they trading in uh um, the reason i include services in that is because there is uh you know the the uh, return of the migrant labor which is going on right now and many of our customers would have otherwise uh used those uh, resources to run their businesses um so we've essentially uh, looked at uh, you know these kind of impact factors on our uh, customers to outline what action should we take with which customer base what should be short term actions where do we need to provide liquidity support what are the segments where we will not lend in the short term things of that nature the second key uh, uh action that we took was to make sure that we can strengthen our collections capacity right so uh we were geared up for a certain volume of collections uh given our overall portfolio size and what kind of delinquencies we normally see uh and hence scenario planning on what kind of delinquencies may we start to see from here on uh is an important one to be able to staff that function up uh adequately most of our collections uh is in any case done over phone calls so from a physical disruption standpoint uh, we are seeing an impact on late bucket collections but not necessarily uh on the bulk of where our customer base lies uh the collection piece also now has gotten uh, somewhat more complicated with the moratorium uh, requirements uh, so figuring out that process of in the collection process how does the moratorium dovetail uh, how do we offer it how do we make it convenient for users to consent to that moratorium uh, so that whole system design uh, has happened the third piece has been uh, you know both liquidity and solvency planning uh, we you know we uh, raise capital from other nbfcs and banks as wholesale borrowings uh, and we want to make sure that through this crisis we can a serve those uh, repayments back to them but more importantly we are uh, in compliance with various covenants that they will set if we think that we are going to breach on certain covenants then be able to have a proactive discussion with those lenders so that they know what we are doing uh, to address some of those issues uh so these were the three uh, you know big pockets of immediate action that we took and where a lot of our energy was directed in the first couple of weeks of the lockdown over the past 7 to 10 days we have been able to uh, address some of these issues but also hence orient ourselves to saying what are the opportunity areas that we should be looking at not necessarily in the lockdown phase but over the next 9 to 12 months uh we do not want to be in a situation and given our balance sheet we don't think we will need to be in a situation where we are uh, uh doing uh, no incremental disbursements over a period of time and hence we have prioritized the set of segments and criteria as per which uh, we will be making fresh disbursements once the lockdowns are over uh some criteria that we are adopting there is what kind of support do our existing customers need uh you know within our core base of customers that we currently originate how do our credit criteria need to uh, adjust uh, you know i walked through some of those uh, parameters earlier uh, and are there new kinds of opportunities that will be available to us uh, given the situation are there a better set of borrowers who might want to access our uh, lending uh, services uh, because you know larger banks and nbfcs may be clamping down even more uh you know are there been businesses that will see a higher demand uh in these times of healthcare crisis than they would normally do uh so that is the last part of the exercise that we have started to engage in over the last 7 to 10 days uh to see how we can build a healthier business and be more relevant to our customers over the next 9 to 12 months so i will pause here uh you know happy to take questions when we get there but i just want to lay out in summary what are the three or four uh, lines of action that we have taken so far uh thanks alok uh, very nice uh, to hear your views and what you are doing on about the delinquency management piece particularly because i think more and more we are now 
looking at the post covid uh, situation as the crisis and the lockdown ceases to exist uh, in the near future uh, so interesting to hear uh, what you are doing uh, next uh, i would request loik uh, to take up uh, the uh, speaking slot uh, i finance has been one of the leaders in uh, cambodia a market which has does not have so many uh, digital lenders till now they have a lot of digital payment providers but digital lenders are very limited so like all yours it would be very interesting to look at uh, how you are doing stuff in cambodia which also does not have as strict a lockdown and a uh, closure a business closure as other geographies uh, so like please go ahead thanks uh, chin so hello everybody my name is uh, loic nige i'm a shareholder and board member at uh, i finance chasing So I Finance Leasing is a leasing company based in Cambodia. Um, we provide financing for the purchase of uh, vehicles such as motorcycles and the purchase of uh, appliances such as uh, refrigerators, air conditioning, air conditioning units and uh, and so on. Um, so I mean I want to say today no matter how digital you are uh, your business is likely to be deeply impacted by the COVID-19. and uh, that's very true for lenders as well we are where that are facing i mean a diminishing demand for their services and uh, portfolio quality deterioration uh, but um, financial institutions who have uh, strong uh, digital foundations are able to operate at 100% or close to 100% um, i mean digital operations are very helpful in uh, continuing serving customers and ensuring business continuity and uh, operating in a safe environment uh, with fewer uh, physical interactions um at in and at i finance we worked a lot over the past years on uh, building our digital platform uh we basically worked on uh, three main angles uh the first one is the customer acquisition and processing of uh, loan applications so we built a set of uh, digital modules that cover everything from the customer acquisition to its onboarding to the underwriting and to the settlement and to the management of, of the loan uh the second angle was the handling of payment and i finance all of our um cash transactions are digital we did that by leveraging other fintechs in cambodia that provide uh, uh, digital payments and uh, e-wallet services and the third angle is the leverage of data i mean we have uh, real time insights into our operations into our uh, portfolio so that's uh, really helpful uh, during these days and uh, so this this digital uh, transformation we've gone through is i mean beyond providing better uh, customer experience and bringing uh, operational efficiency in the removal of this unnecessary physical contacts has been really helpful uh, today in creating a safer services for our clients in creating a safer work environment for employees in the face of uh, covid-19 um and uh, i mean having digital operations really enable business continuity like our staff can work from home if necessary um communication with clients is through digital channels so so uh, we we can continue uh, operating as uh, as usual um and on top of that uh, having digital a digital platform really helps in um in being agile and in being to amend the processes if necessary i mean we don't know what is going to happen tomorrow so uh it's it's really helpful in other, in order to to be agile and and more reactive and uh, on top of that of course we have a set of uh, physical uh, measures to improve uh, the environment safety uh we have masks we have uh, hand sanitizers for staff we clean workstations twice a day we increase um distance between the workstations for so that each staff is uh, has a i mean as a safety distance between each other and and so on and there's, there's a lot of other measures that we have done in order to um make the work environment uh, as safe as possible um so i mean this covid-19 i think uh, that, that now everyone realizes that uh, digital financial services are critical um i believe that some institutions will accelerate their digital transformation and adopt uh, new digital tools but also some other institutions might have to cut cost and uh, due to current situation in order to protect short term cash flow and therefore delaying um digitalization uh, projects i mean selectively that the ones that have yet to 
start their digital journey will not do it right now. I mean, it's a lot of investment, it's a lot of risk, and with the current environment, I mean, it, it doesn't really work out. But the ones that have already started this, um, this process will probably be more comfortable in uh, spinning up those projects and, uh, and to become uh, more fully digital. Um, I mean, in Cambodia, you really have a mix of uh, institutions. You have some that are more traditional, uh, that don't do digital lending. You have others that are more digital advanced. Um, so it's really like some are using tablets, some are still using paper to fill out customer applications. So it's really a mix of a bit everything. Um, and the largest institution in Cambodia have started uh, operating about 20 years ago. And the market has been relatively unattended for a very long period of time. And it's just very recently that you have this need for more sophisticated products for to tap into new market segments uh, that you need sophisticated um, uh, advertisements, sophisticated delivery channels. So it's really, really recent that uh, the digital transformation in Cambodia within the financial sector has uh, started. Uh, I mean, I can take the, 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 uh, the comparison with, uh, with Myanmar where the economy opened in 2012, 2014, Micro lenders started operating in uh, you know, 2015, and straight away they were able to leverage the cloud services, the latest uh, core banking systems, and uh, basically they are uh, digital native. But uh, and they are already using tablets. Where in Cambodia, not everybody is, is using tablets. So, but so that really contrasts with Cambodia because in Cambodia you need to go through that lengthy digital transformation, and that doesn't happen uh, overnight. Um, and, and just before I was mentioning that I finance all the transa cash transactions are performed digitally. Um, we also have in Cambodia a few um, startups and fintechs that provide e-wallet services, that provide uh, payment services platforms. Um, so on the surface, it seems pretty digital, but below that, I mean, it's still a very much a cash-based economy. People exchange notes between each other. They go to the shop, they pay by cash, they, they I mean, you have cash everywhere. Um, so I, I think that uh, we are hoping for a bit of a faster um, shift to uh, digital services, but it has been uh, a bit uh, slower than, uh, than expected. Um, uh, the central bank has been uh, very aware of that and has been very supportive for digital uh, financial services. Just recently, they have encouraged pay people to use uh, those digital platforms in order to avoid exchanging uh, potentially contaminated uh, notes and therefore spreading contamination. And more, more interestingly, uh, the Central Bank of Cambodia is about to launch a unified payment and money transfer platform relying on blockchain. So basically, everyone in Cambodia will be able to transfer cash between each other uh, no matter which bank uh, they are using. So that is extremely uh, powerful and will increase uh, convenience for uh, Cambodian citizens. It will boost, hopefully, the ad adoption of uh, digital financial services and make those digital services a new norm. And uh, also, I mean, because the Central Bank of Cambodia is behind this platform that will boost confidence and, and push people to get familiar with uh, exchanging money uh, digitally. And uh, lastly, I mean, I want to say that this is uh, very unique to Cambodia, the central bank stepping in and trying to push, um, you know, like innovation forward. And uh, yeah, let's see how it plays out. But uh, uh, that's, uh, I really like that uh, initiative. I think it's uh, really interesting. Um, yeah, feel free to let me know if you have uh, any questions. Okay. Thanks, Loic. Uh, great to hear about the Cambodian perspective. Uh, just for our listeners, the blockchain platform that Loic was mentioning is called Backom, which is a really uh, good, uh, interesting initiative by the central bank. Uh, it's for listeners in India and elsewhere. It's somewhat similar to the UPI model, but it's really interesting. Uh, also, Loic, it was good to know from you, your um, your perspective that those who have launched their digital journey are probably ahead in this crisis scenario. Uh, otherwise, in this situation with stressed cash flows, it would be very difficult for them to go on a digital path now. Uh, so, an interesting perspective on uh, 
what to do and what was the point probably earlier to enter into digitization okay uh, we'll move on to the next panelist jagdish uh, if you can uh, take up the speaking slot please uh, you will have to switch on your uh, video uh, yeah we can hear you and yeah, hi everyone as well yeah hi please go ahead. yeah so uh, so just a quick background about uh, the organization i represent uh, 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 I head Via Finance, uh, Via Finance. Uh, we are a five-year-old uh, microfinance organization. Uh, we have 300 branches across the country and uh, around 700,000 customers. Uh, we manage a portfolio of uh, around uh, uh, 1250 uh, uh, crores, which is approximately 200 uh, plus 200 million dollars. Uh, we have 2,000 employees. So our model is primarily a typical microfinance model with a difference. I would call ourselves as a a hybrid microfinance company because uh, we are a completely paperless company and uh, every employee of ours uh, while it's a high touch like any typical grameen microfinance model uh, we have feet on the ground who interact with the customers and there is a very high level of relationship which is very important to the segment of customers that we target uh, primarily 100 uh, percent women borrowers low income households uh, primarily rural uh, focus rural and semi-urban focused so we have uh, so our digital transformation started uh, uh, from the day one because uh, you could say we are a second generation microfinance company unlike legacy we didn't have any legacy systems so we started off with a completely uh, cloud based platform where uh, every loan officer was equipped with a phone or a tablet and every aspect of the operation was paperless right from sourcing to uh, uh, kyc checks to uh, information collection pre approval uh, approvals uh, disbursement also was we had a, the API tie-ups with banking uh, banks at the back end. So, so the whole operations, including the disbursements of the money, was into the bank account of the customer. We never ever disbursed cash in in uh, uh, disburse a loan in cash. Mm -hmm. However, the critical thing to note is this is all assisted digital because our customers do not have uh, you know uh, there are uh, very strong barriers for our customers to adopt digital. Right, the first and foremost barrier of which is uh, the availability of a smartphone, uh, literacy in terms of ability to use uh, uh, use smartphone where it is available, use a use other than basic applications, and a very important aspect is also trust in uh, digital money because they say low literacy, uh, low income households, uh, the literacy, the trust levels have been quite low, in spite of penetration of wallets and various other uh, digital banking applications, cash continues to be the predominant mode of transaction for the segment of customers that we serve. Uh, and that's a segment that we chose to serve. Uh, so that is not likely to change uh, in the near future. But we have seen that transformations can get uh, uh, accelerated in a very short period of time uh, on the basis of external occurrences. In this specific instances, we've seen the sector has seen many crises like this in the past. Like uh, I will take you back uh, three years back, we had this demonetization crisis where there was a lack of cash in the, because of withdrawal of cash tender from the, by the government, uh, RBI at that point of time. And uh, the sector transformed very, very quickly. It adapted and evolved into a 100% cashless disbursement model. Uh, in 2017, less than 10% of the disbursements were happening through bank accounts. I would say today, uh, more than 90% is uh, happening through the bank accounts. So the sector, microfinance sector has adapted to the evolving uh, situations on the ground. The challenge right now is the collections continue to be 90% cash. So how do we as a sector, the challenge that my company and most of my colleagues from the other company sector face and which we are quite confident that we'll be able to work around is how do we move uh, the collection aspect also into digital? Because today we are in a very unique situation. Our customers, especially in rural areas, are uh, the impact of the uh, COVID is relatively less because the agriculture operations, the uh, the rural dairy operations and the uh, small business trading which happens, small retailers within a rural ecosystem continues to be almost near normal. I would not say it's normal. I would say it is 70-80% near normal. So many of our customers are willing to make the payments but unfortunately because they are not used to paying through a banking system or they don't have digital uh, banking channels and they're not familiarized with that, they are not able to pay to the customer. So, so, so in a way like Customers are forcibly uh, finding it difficult to uh, make the payments. I think this is a, something which is a sector uh, uh, that, uh, and definitely my company, we are working on ways. So we quickly, like we, like, like we transformed during demonetization, 
in terms of uh, dispersing cashless and going to a completely digital process. I think post COVID, I think the sector is also likely to see some rapid transformation to enable digital payment models for customers. Uh, the challenges remain uh, uh, on the ground in terms of barriers to using digital, but there are a lot of other uh, uh, other models which have evolved in the last uh, last uh, few years, including models like CSP model. There is there is physical points where customers in, within the village can go and deposit cash. Uh, there are models like eNash and there are models like UPI. So which uh, I think the need going forward and specifically uh, our uh, plan is to uh, evolve uh, the uh, customer side of the digital adoption quite quickly. So basically we would we intend to move from assisted digital to some amount of customer initiated digital transactions very soon. Uh, so that uh, we will uh, not only make it convenient to customers in times like this, but also insulate uh, uh, our business model against uh, such future shocks. Okay, thanks Jagdish. Uh, quick and short summary. It was, uh, I mean, you pointed out the perennial problem which we faced during demonetization also in India, which was collections. Uh, although demonetization ended up pushing most of the disbursements to a digital mode, but collection still remains a challenge. So, I mean, yeah, that's an industry-wide uh, puzzle which we have to solve, particularly for the rural uh, population. But what was an interesting point you made that the rural sector is not impacted so much. Uh, I mean, we in the cities feel that the lockdown is all pervasive, uh, but in the rural economy, mostly the agri-economy, it is still uh, going on. So that's an interesting uh, take. Uh, it's then on the industry to facilitate uh, uh, timely collections through innovative mechanisms. So yeah, we'll move on uh, to our next panelist, uh, Sakshi. Uh, Sakshi represents uh, GSMA on the panel and GSMA has been doing some really interesting work around mobile money-led uh, digital lending, which is quite uh, uh, prominent mainly in Africa. It's al also interesting uh, that this sector has almost seen a mini crisis uh, just very recently where there were a lot of issues uh, in Kenya about people, uh, Kenya and a couple of other African countries uh, where people defaulted on these uh, small ticket size loans and were reported to the credit bureau. And now uh, COVID-19 has uh, come and hit the sector. So it would be interesting to hear from Sakshi how the sector is coping, how the regulators are managing. So the floor is all yours, Sakshi. Please go ahead. Hey, thanks, Sachin. Thanks. Uh, hello, everybody. It's a pleasure to be on this panel. Uh, just quickly starting from scratch, my name is Sakshi, like Achin mentioned, I'm the Regulatory Specialist for Asia with uh, the GSMA. Uh, GSMA is an association of mobile operators globally and it, prints, it represents the interest of about 750 operators and 400 companies in the broader mobile ecosystem. Uh, in, in today's session, how I've sort of tried and structured uh, my initial comments are basically to start with some headline numbers, which would help the audience understand why is GSMA or why mobile money is relevant for a discussion around digital lending. Uh, post that, I, I wanted to roughly touch upon uh, what are some of the models that are prevalent uh, in this ecosystem, like how, how a mobile network operator or a mobile money provider participates in general. And then some interesting responses to COVID that we have seen so that we could link and, and just highlight takeaways. Uh, so without further ado, I'll get on to the headline numbers. Uh, so if, I'm sure this is something that everybody would have read. I've picked up one of the numbers from uh, Global Findex 2017 report. Uh, it had quoted that nearly 44% of all adults in developing countries borrow money, uh, but only 9% of those borrowers uh, actually borrow from a financial institution. So that sort of highlights the significant gap that exists. Uh, a lot of research which was then done on Findex data also sort of indicated that many a times it's the lack of financial records uh, that ends up being one of the main reason why a large proportion of underserved population are excluded from formal uh, lending. Uh, GSMA recently conducted an analysis uh, where we actually even found out that mobile money uh, is bridging this information gap between borrowers and financial institutions and is helping individuals and MSMEs benefit from the opportunities that lie around access to credit. Uh, one of our flagship publications of our team, which is the Global Adoption Survey, we conducted every year. We released it just last month. So the 2019 Global Adoption Survey also indicated that the number of deployments offering credit, number of mobile money providers uh, who responded that they offer credit as a service actually grew by about 25% in just one year. 
uh, but interestingly nearly 70 percent of those respondents were offering credit were actually partnering with a regulated financial institution so on most situations this this is a more prevalent model in which how mobile money providers participate so just talking briefly about why 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 exactly i'm here in this panel uh, so mobile money providers that many of you would know and i I'll, I'll take names of uh, the countries that i read people are coming from so in india it could actually be an airtel payment bank a paytm uh, likes of these uh, if i talk about examples in cambodia it would be wing cambodia and the likes again um, in myanmar we had one of the panelists talk about myanmar uh, wave myanmar is another interesting example so while mobile money started essentially from african markets we've seen a lot of uh, evolved models coming in Asian markets uh, as well and now they're picking up stream uh, how these mobile money providers uh, then finally contribute towards digital lending is through multiple models a model man is basically this group of mobile money providers who would who would partner with licensed lending institutions so these could be uh, sacos in Africa or these could be microfinance institutions or these could be directly partnering with banks as well and through them as partners they would uh, provide uh, digital credit uh, the other option that we've seen is just acting as a you know a rail or a field access service to them so this would be them partnering with a fintech a peer to peer lending startup or other interesting startups that we've seen sort of coming up and they would just be their distribution channel or their field access rails now why these models are important is because the responsibility of a mobile money provider in both these models differs uh, what they are responsible for what what they need to take care of sort of differs in both these uh, these models uh, and it, it's only when we understand which model a particular provider is, would we be able to understand to what extent do can they contribute towards responding in the COVID-19 situation, actually. Uh, so some of the examples, uh, uh, again, going directly to COVID-19 responses that we've seen in the digital lending landscape. Uh, if, if I talk about mobile money providers in Africa and even this side, we've seen multiple uh, providers who've sort of waived P2P, which is person-to-person -person transaction fees. We've seen waivers on bank-to-wallet or wallet-to-bank transfers as well. So multiple like that. Many of them are directly initiated by mobile money providers, uh, or many of them have been mandated by the, uh, reg uh, it actually happened because a regulatory guideline requested them to do that. Now this has an impact on credit and lending because when prepayment, uh, repayment uh, happens, uh, it's these, uh, it's these charges that would have been you know applied on those prepayments but if there are waivers this definitely makes it a little easier for people who are willing to pay through digital channels to be able to do that we've seen some very interesting uh, regulatory uh, sort of you know responses as well uh, i think some of them have already been alluded uh, to by the panelists on this group uh, like ministry of finance in malaysia actually uh, imposed a moratorium on S sme installment payment uh, for about 6 months uh, another interesting step that they took is they also reduced the 2 percent interest rate to 0 percent for micro credit scheme so these are all targeted to sort of make sure that uh, customers are able to pay and have the right uh, sort of instruments in place to make sure it's easier moratorium definitely helps we had a similar sort of uh, response from the central bank of sri lanka as well they have established a six month refinancing facility which will in a way help towards providing working capital loan for covid 19 hit businesses and individuals india was definitely being talked about uh, where in india we've had uh, all commercial banks including regional rural banks small finance banks local area banks cooperatives uh, many more are being permitted to allow a moratorium for three months uh, so these are some of the interesting regulatory responses to covid that we've seen which impact mobile money providers and and in turn digital uh, lending and credit what we also saw and sort of stood out was uh, that some lenders who were working in partnership uh, with mobile money providers have waived the mandatory requirement to list defaulting borrowers now this is something uh, that that's more prevalent on the african side uh, where where it's mandatory to list a particular kind of a borrower with the credit bureau if there is a there is some issues regarding prepayment but uh, just because of COVID-19 they've sort of been uh, uh, allowed to uh, waive this particular requirement if it's established that the distress is because of COVID-19 uh, what what we've also seen again very interesting move is uh, and I would like to highlight here is uh, the response from Bangladesh Bank uh, where we've heard that Bangladesh Bank actually came out in support and issued a uh, a notification to relevant authorities within Bangladesh requesting them to consider mobile financial services as an essential service. So in times of these lockdowns, while, while we are all talking about digital lending and credit, uh, 
at the end of the day there is some sort of uh, there is some sort of customer touch point uh, in many situation it's the mobile money agent in the market uh, for the examples that we work with and uh, if that agent is not able to operate uh, because of lockdown or other situation or because he or she is not currently uh, you know consider an essential service so i think this this is a good move uh, and uh, let's see how this impacts the market in general but these are some of the generic responses to covid-19 that we've seen in the market uh, these are still very early days uh, you know the actual changes to norms and things started kicking in only about a couple of weeks ago uh, that's when lockdown started getting imposed on this side of the market so it's very early and we uh, you know i believe we have a long battle to fight before life gets back to normal or the new normal uh, and we'll definitely see a lot more measures coming from mobile money providers or they working in partnership with other digital lenders uh, which would uh, ease the situation uh, i think a crucial point uh, that i would like to highlight before i sort of close uh, achin would be potential impact of the crisis so we believe uh, again especially from a experience in africa and this might percolate to the asian side as well is there might be easier access to credit through digital channels in a short term and maybe in a longer term as well so as more people will have access to digital credit offerings potentially creating oversupply of small digital loans and higher non performing loan ratios so i think all providers and governments in general have to be a little more careful about this uh, you know and maybe digital lending in general has to act a little more responsibly in these times uh, and enforce responsible credit guidelines to ensure that ease of access to credit does not create over indebtedness yeah that would be all from my side yeah and happy to okay. respond to any questions yeah thanks akshi uh, so we'll uh, thanks for your perspective and uh, the specific measure around uh, mobile lending that regulators are taking i also didn't know that there are measures happening even in bangladesh so that's uh, really interesting that even asian regulators are taking this up uh, we'll quickly move to our next panelist uh, jaspreet uh, jaspreet is having some issues with his video feed so we'll have to do it on audio uh jaspreet uh, has been leading the technical initiatives around financial inclusion and digital finance uh, for uncdf and they have done a bunch of work with startups and uh, upcoming uh, financial sector companies so i'll leave jaspreet to give a more uh, asia view of how the situation is evolving and also how does he see sec- uh, the funders and startups uh, reacting to the current situation so oh, thanks jaspreet, for please go ahead yeah uh thank you achin for that introduction and i think uh, to a large part i must just congratulate all my panelists to you know cover a whole lot of you know issues that both the implementers are facing but also you know sakshi in her uh, i have sharing she kind of covered a lot on the regulatory response to for some of the market across asia as well i think without you know really um, you know repeating the same things possibly i'll kind of highlight couple of things that we are looking in, in right now and i think as for sarshi said earlier this is like too early right now in terms of you know how some of these things will shape up uh, but certainly we know that you know the the new normal in the new normal as well the way the countries are going to do business and how they will basically prepare for a more resilient mechanism to meet such future uh, future risk in in, in going ahead Will be would have a big change in terms of you know how things will shape up, and what couple of things that we have seen certainly and was spoken about was that we have seen acceleration of digital in in different ways and means. Possibly you know especially with how people have started engaging or um, interacting with digital channels in their day to day lives. But with that, uh, there is a big segregation of you know how the urban market and the rural market is engaging in in these two uh, ways. uh broadly from the perspective of digital lending itself because you know we had and we have different digital lending models and that sakshi talked of but also the fact that you know other panelists you know through their models spoke of that where we have seen that you know the digital lending models which are purely digital in terms of p2p lending or you know which which is basically facilitating as a platform uh, a lot of um, players that we are seen in the asian market uh, depending on you know how how do they how they go about doing the credit scoring or the initial due diligence has a lot of bearing in terms of you know how they see uh, outlook with a with their own business especially in terms of repayments coming in and you know uh, different segments to which they were actually lending out how they see it to be responding back 
and uh, it all kind of ties down to the earlier process of due diligence and appraisal which has a where with which has a big bearing on the repayment itself and the quality of you know collection that can be ensured with that obviously having said that um we we have certainly seen digitization as a in general to be part of some of the lending organizations uh, you know especially the microfinance institutions where obviously this has basically helped kind of bring down the operational cost for institution in that sense and you know that that's a kind of positive sign and i think that we see that it will kind of continue in, in that momentum uh, even going forward uh, secondly the other thing that has been very important is the amount of leverage that uh, these lenders of the platforms have basically created with the financial institution it, it will also have a overbearing on in terms of you know how would the banks be able to then unlock further capital down the line and what is the own bank's own risk appetite or, or uh, financial institution's own risk appetite towards that uh, while there is some degree of regulatory support then has been provided like what was mentioned of the moratorium in case of malaysia or the interest uh, uh, subvention basically but we we also looking at other financial instruments that are being structured in order to create a pathway for financial institutions to you know unlock the balance sheet example in terms of guarantee structures and things like that so that is those are the kind of things that are you know being discussed at various levels to see you know that what will be those various policy response uh, with financial and non financial instruments which could actually ensure that the sector while it will go through a rundown in a way because of loss of job and employment and a lot of other issues that a lot of people spoke about but the idea would be certainly to see you know that how can the wheels of the economy can keep on moving especially with digital um, lenders or the platforms who are kind of evolving players in the market can continue engaging in a way that you know this does not provide a knee jerk to them i think this is kind of still very early day to you know say that how those response uh, or those measures will uh, overlay in different market context but certainly you know that will help in and ensuring that the engines will keep on running uh, while ensuring that some of the early learnings from that has come up during this period as well especially in terms of the the due diligence and collections and things like that are you know kind of tightened out in in different ways obviously with all of this combined is are the response of various investors uh, and, and funders you know who have been funding these models uh, there has been a lot of requests going around in, especially in terms of trying to relook at uh, restructuring of uh, some of these investments and uh, i think uh, we've seen we spoke to a lot of investors uh, primarily who have been into this space and we have seen that they've kind of gone about very proactive engagement with their uh, portfolio uh, especially in terms of figuring out what are, what kind of risk ex exist and at what point and where can they actually support uh, you know restructuring some of them but also you know take a more long term view in terms of uh using this as an opportunity window to course correct you know things which which could have uh, been done in different way altogether so i think that's all in in the making possibly you know we'll see it based on individual investors response or you know how uh, different governments and dif different uh, sectors will basically play out overall but uh, certainly there is a lot to be learned from this and sure uh, uh you know maybe we can certainly learn from this and see you know how we can we should not repeat the mistakes in going ahead in future and build a more resilient system i'll stop it there okay great thanks uh, jaspreet i'll uh, quickly now jump into questions we have uh, close to uh, 180 people on the call who have been uh, sending a lot of questions i'll request uh, the panelists also to start their video feed uh so that uh, we can see you while you are answering the questions uh yeah so uh, the first uh, there's a bunch of questions around the whole moratorium questions where there has been some moratoriums or uh, regulatory forbearance has been announced and there have been questions about how the lenders are addressing this and are they able to communicate it uh, clearly and in a lucid manner to the borrowers because the moratoriums are also um subjective of how an institution implements it whether it's an op an opt out and an opt in the in interest uh, continues to accrue so how is the whole moratorium question being a dealt with 
and be essentially being communicated to the borrowers. Uh, that's the, there's the, there's a bunch of questions around that. So uh, maybe Alok, you can uh, pick that up and uh, followed by that Jagdish. Uh, how are you managing this uh, with the borrowers? Yeah. So uh, <clears throat> no, I think the first part is uh, you know just the preparation for the moratorium, and there are several issues that are involved there, you know, as per the... Alok, you need to be just a touch louder, just a little bit louder. Yeah, so as per the, you know, RBI circular, uh, the moratorium has to be made to made available to borrowers who whose businesses are uh, influenced by the COVID crisis. So the first thing that we did was to prepare a list of borrowers who um, were in that category. Uh, and we uh, you know, normally have some of the business information of the borrowers that goes through our systems on an ongoing basis. So we have a fairly good visibility of the borrower's business, not just when we um, you know, send a bank debit mandate, but through the course of the entire month. So we have classified our uh, customers uh, by their need for the moratorium. The second was to put the moratorium policy in place. Uh, it has to be a board approved policy. Uh, so we have put that in place. In our case, for example, we have uh, considered all borrowers who were current as of 1st of March uh, to be eligible for the moratorium because any uh, stress prior to that uh, is not on account of COVID. Right? The third thing uh, has been to uh, you know uh, manage this process both from a proactive standpoint as well as reactive. So there is a set of borrowers that have gone out and we have asked them to opt in to a moratorium. Uh, and there is a set of borrowers who are coming back to us uh, through various different interfaces. Sometimes the sales, same sales interface that sold to them, sometimes through the customer service. And in many cases, even when the collection calls are going in, they're saying, uh, you know, I want that moratorium and am I eligible for that? So just making sure that the processes are all in place to be able to funnel all of this, have uh, easy uh, eligibility check at each point of customer contact and hence be able to extend those moratoriums to customers who want them uh, at the point of uh, first uh, resolution. Uh, we did consider the possibility of giving moratorium to all customers. Uh, but what we are realizing is there's a set of customers out there who don't want the moratorium. Right? So if uh, their own financial situation is not compromised at this point in time, then they don't necessarily want to bear the extra interest that comes with uh, delaying the principal repayments. And hence, uh, on an overall basis, uh, the way we are operating this is an opt-in mechanism rather than an opt-out mechanism. Jagdish, if you can uh, yeah, pitch in with uh, yeah. how so, IA is handling. Yeah, so I think a lot of what Alok has uh, shared is applicable to us as well. I think microfinance, there is a unique situation that even if a customer wants to pay, we are not in a position to go and collect the money. Right. So there is a slightly uh, different uh, connotation out there because of the 90% uh, plus prevalence of cash collections. So uh, like Alok said, we have RBA has uh, moved very quickly to announce uh, on March 27th, the Reserve Bank of India and uh, moratorium up to March, May 31st. So uh, as an organization, as a sector also, we have the, the association of uh, microfinance associations of India, MFIN sector has issued an advisory to all its members to honor the same uh, uh, what the RBI has uh, proposed. And uh, we have given a moratorium to all our customers, uh, but it is an uh, it is a optional moratorium like Alok mentioned, because as Alok clearly pointed out, we also see that there is a equal percentage of customers who want to make the payment because they do not want to pay the interest during a moratorium period. So we will be giving them an opportunity to uh, stick to the original schedule once the lockdown is lifted. Uh, uh, and then otherwise, uh, and those who want a, you know, we are going to take a written uh, confirmation about those who want a moratorium and those who don't want a moratorium so that there is 100% transparency because of the large number of customers, low literacy levels, uh, organizations, we want to make sure that, uh, that the spirit and uh, rule of the moratorium, which has been, uh, because these are special circumstances and it is very important that every organization ensures that uh, those who are in difficult situation to repay are in a position to avail of that. So the uh, MFIN, which is the industry association body, is working very closely with all its members. Uh, together, MFIN uh, uh, members, are 97 members, represent 
almost 5.3 crore, uh, uh, 5.53 million uh, microfinance borrowers, which is almost a third of India's population. So I think uh, uh, we are bringing in consensus to try to work on a concerted manner on the moratorium. And that has been helping in the last one and a half month. The clarity of communication to a customer is very high. And similarly, once the lockdown is lifted also, we will be giving a very high uh, clear communication from the industry body. Okay, great. Uh, there's also a bunch of questions around how you are managing your operations, more from an employee perspective. Um, because uh, business is reduced, there's lockdowns, there's moratoriums. So what are organizations doing to keep the employee morale high? And how are you rejigging basically uh, your uh, staff uh, communication patterns uh, and staff handling in the post-COVID situation? Because uh, once the post-COVID situation happens, a lot of portfolio follow-ups, uh, areas which are at risk, sectors which are at risk will have to be handled by the same employees. So the question really has two parts. One is what you are doing currently uh, to handle your staff and your employees and how are you preparing them kind of for the post-COVID scenario? Uh, that, that's essentially the questions that have come around. Uh, maybe Loic, you can take a first shot of it and then we can go to the other panelists. Like, uh, you are a new oh, right. Yeah, can you repeat just, just a question quickly? I, I the question know. is around managing your employees. So what are you doing to manage the employees currently in a mm -hmm. lockdown or limited economic activity period? And B, the second part to it is how you are handling and rejigging them or retraining re them to handle the post-COVID situation, which will also come uh, hopefully very soon. So what two parts, what are you doing currently and right. what are you doing to rescale or retrain them for the post COVID scenario? Right. Um, I mean, so, so, uh, right now, you know, we, we have, uh, obviously a decreased, uh, demand for our services. <clears throat> so most of the people that were most of the sales people, we have been, uh, reallocated them to, uh, working with, uh, communicating with our current clients working with collections, um, kind of trying to understand um, what the clients, what difficulties our clients are facing and how we can, uh, we can uh, work with our clients. So we are really, we've really shifted a lot of resources uh, towards that. And uh, I mean, within other, otherwise, I mean, we are providing, uh, I mean, um, trainings and, uh, and also we are trying to, with them on some other long-term projects. I mean, we try to keep everybody busy and uh, and uh, and all the projects uh, uh, moving forward. But then, yeah, one, one, for the sales people, there's less demand, and then uh, we have been able to to shift them. Uh, and uh, post COVID, I mean, um, I I mean the, the COVID situation showed them showed us that we were able to allow our employees to work from home so employees can access the system from home and can can work this way so so going forward i believe that uh if an employee uh could face some uh, health issue or something if they, if they want still want to continue working for a few, a few days uh, from home then that will be uh, possible to do so, so we kind of pushed, we kind of explored uh, possibilities thanks to this COVID and uh, yeah, that we can uh, reuse uh, going forward. Alok or Jagdish, uh, any thoughts on this? Uh, I mean, uh, many of you. Yeah, so, uh, so, uh, so yes, it's been a very stressful time for, uh, for employees across. Uh, so uh, what we, uh, are doing is uh, there are two steps you have taken one to reassure them uh, in terms of uh, that the organization is there to support and uh, second is in terms of keeping them continuously uh, engaged uh, as an organization we have uh, we have taken out an insurance policy to ensure uh, like because you know we operate in the rural areas and there's a lot of human touch and there is a lot of one to one connect at the field level so we have taken a policy out for the next one year to uh, ensure that there is an amount at least equivalent to two months of salary payable in case anyone is uh, uh, is uh, contracts the virus. So small steps, but and parallelly we have been doing a lot of engagement with our employees. We have been making sure that uh, they we have given ad loan advances where required 
salary advances to purchase provisions and emergency uh, home home requirements because a lot of employees in the microfinance space are frontline employees feet on the ground uh, uh, similar profile as our borrowers uh, low amount of savings uh, the need to work on a regular basis so so we make sure that uh, we are keeping them constantly engaged we are using all digital tools like zoom and uh, uh, dial in calls to ensure there is everyday engagement we have a chain cycle there is a pre programmed calendar in which people have to dial in they have to participate in, in chats we are doing activities like quizzes and uh, learning programs we have created animated digital content so that you know the uh, the communication uh, flow not only from us to our frontline employees but also from our frontline employees to the customers both these channels are kept open great i'll uh, move ahead since we have a bunch of other questions uh, there's another question about how are institutions going and negotiating with their funders and uh, people who have extended credit lines to them uh, is there flexibility uh, in uh, such conversation with funders how are um, us institutions approaching them and basically what kind of approach is being uh, followed is uh, is the funder extended some emergency lines of funding or uh, is it capital recycling basically what's the approach around it and what is the nature of conversations that's uh, happening with the funders right so i think jaspreet uh, it would be good to have a view from your end and then maybe we can uh, move to alok uh, jaspreet if you can take a stab at that uh, sure so at yeah, this point of time the funders are kind of you know taking a very cautious approach to see you know uh, how this will all unfold and where all they need to basically make a commitment in in both medium to short term long term uh, obviously uh, some funders have responded with uh, emergency cash injections and you know are open to relook at the options in which in ways in which we can they can you know help keep the portfolio uh, more sustainable and active uh, possibly that's also the part of the reason that at this point of time the funders are also working believe at least you know those who have reached out to their um, investors and funders more openly they they have been able to they will see a little good response in terms of um, you know funders open to the idea of relooking at things and at least working with them hand in hand but obviously this cannot be said blanket for everyone but possibly for a, a big lot this this has been the way they have been dealing with it because i think uh, everyone realize that uh, this this situation is not a normal one and you know we need to take uh, measures which which will basically allow for at least the financial stability to be maintained within the sector overall achin okay, okay great yeah uh, alok uh, you have had any discussions uh, in your business with the funders and how have they been reacting yeah so uh, you know i think uh, the funders are also looking at uh, rbi for guidance and so when the initial moratorium uh, notification had come in there was a fair bit of confusion around whether banks should give moratorium to <clears throat> nbfcs and most banks had taken a wait and watch attitude towards that uh, in the in the announcements today rbi has now explicitly opened up some liquidity windows uh, which you know not just capital market but otherwise uh for nbfcs to gain access to uh so i think uh, now will be a time when banks start to open up to those discussions uh however one of the things that uh, you know works both with financiers and you mentioned employees earlier uh in these times is to over communicate uh so we've been in touch with all of our uh, funders to make sure they understand uh, what our uh, financial position is what our liquidity situation looks like are able to meet our obligations uh but also how are we planning to operate the business going forward uh and you know the fact that they can feel comfortable with that uh so i think uh, the task of first order is to make sure that uh lenders are uh feeling confident uh of our business and our approach to handling this crisis uh and some of those discussions uh will start to move towards not just emergency financing but even uh ongoing financing discussions uh with those lenders okay great uh, uh sakshi there is a specific question for you uh in terms of the previous uh, pandemic of ebola 
we saw mobile money providers taking a very frontline uh, role in uh, delivering payments to healthcare workers and emergency services so a couple of participants uh, attendees have asked uh, do you see such responses currently also in the mobile money space and uh, b uh, how are mobile i mean uh, there's some confusion that uh, some relaxations around mobile credit has been announced through mobile money instruments are they uh, able to implement it on the ground so those are the two parts of the question Sure, sure. So I'll respond to the first one quickly. And yes, uh, during the Ebola crisis, uh, mobile money did play a crucial role uh, with regards to payment to healthcare workers uh, on the African side, definitely. Uh, and and we are seeing similar trend at this point also. If I have to take a quick example that comes to my mind, I think just about last week uh, we've had uh, Wave Myanmar, which is a uh, an MNO, uh, which is a MMP provider based out of Myanmar. Uh, they reached out to the community in general, saying if there are any NGOs or other providers. Or uh, you know, uh, or any donor community who is looking to do any disbursement specific as a response to COVID-19, uh, they'll be happy to partner and provide their service. Uh, and if I remember correctly, they also mentioned that uh, the cost might not uh, the, the the cost for the rails would be very limited or almost nil. Uh, so we are seeing similar initiatives in different markets coming up. Uh, but but I think, like I said before, and many other panelists have iterated, this is a continuously evolving situation. Uh, it's not like three weeks ago, any of us knew it, it would reach to this level that multiple countries would have, you know, lockdowns for three plus three weeks or much more to be expected in future. So I think uh, in a stepwise manner, uh, we've seen many of them coming forward and saying P2P waivers, uh, bank to wallet waivers, and and that's in a way a mobile money providers way to say that we are happy to support in this in you know humanitarian disbursements, and we'll definitely see many more uh, coming forward. Yeah, being cognizant of their sustainability, definitely. Uh, so that's one part. Uh, the second question uh, I think you had asked was about uh, some credit rebate coming from MMPs. Did I get it correctly? Uh, so I think I think that yeah, is why absolutely. I thought yeah. yeah that's why I thought it was important to talk about how a mobile money provider participates in majority of the situation. Like uh, in the survey that we did in 2019 adoption survey, 70% of the people who were offering digital credit uh, they were actually doing it in partnership with banks or other providers. So in most situation, the credit does not sit uh, on the balance sheet of a mobile money provider. It it normally is with an entity which is a financing entity at the back end. And and most of the time, a mobile money provider would essentially play the role of a distributing uh, agent. You know, the distribution channel essentially falls uh, in our in our domain. And in a situation like this, uh, how and what sort of credit rebates would be provided then completely falls on on the financing entity. And many a times, uh, like other panelists mentioned, how the governments are or the central banks are reacting to it. So it would be hard uh, for uh, MMP to go ahead or make such rebates because uh, it, it, it does not fall in the domain of function. Uh, by the model itself, they are giving those loans on somebody else's books. I, I, I hope that answers the question, Achin. Yeah, sure, sure. Okay, uh, I think we'll take one more last question. We have about five minutes remaining. And I think I saw a really interesting one uh, come up. Uh, I'll ask all the panelists to take a quick one minute answer or uh, 30 second answer. Uh, the question was, is there a positive out of this? Will this lead to increased digitization, increased digital lending, or will the sector struggle? How do you see the sector coming out of this? And uh, are there some positive changes uh, that you think see coming out of uh, this crisis? So I think we'll reverse the order now of the panelists that we have. So the last one can speak first, just speak. Uh, it would be good if you can start off and we'll do a reverse order. No, we, certainly, quick answers. See, we certainly see a positive momentum towards digitization, especially, you know, post COVID scenario uh, across all different space, not only in digital lending, but digital becoming more mainstream in terms of how people interact. Obviously it will still be managed with a lot of caution in terms of, you know, how people behavior change needs to be tackled in that sense. But yeah, uh, positive overall. Okay, Sakshi. Myself, yes, uh, I think people can hear me. No, completely aligned with what Jaspreet said. So I, I would do a plus one on that. Uh, but if I have to add, and I think some changes are already coming in. Uh, so. Uh, you know, we've, we're seeing a lot of uh, central banks and the others uh, or, or banks actually giving a higher weightage or increasing the portfolio that they otherwise had for digital 
lending. Uh, and I expect that change. So we've had Central Bank of Kenya, KCB Bank and Safaricom making similar uh, announcements. And I expect that to follow in the days to come this side as well. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That's really interesting. Going more on digital. Uh, Loic, uh, you up next. Quick 16 second answer. Yeah. So positive I mean, changes so I, moving ahead. Yeah. Yes, yeah, I believe the, that we push the momentum for uh, the penetration of uh, digital financial services in Cambodia, especially digital payments, digital transfers, delivery of loans uh, will be, I mean, everybody will be pushed to move to, uh, towards uh, digital delivery going forward. Okay, uh, Jagdish, you are up next. Uh, uh, just a spin on the question. We've seen a recent, not so uh, I mean, uh, scenario of demonetization and now we have the COVID crisis, two crises within a short two, three year period. So what is your take uh, in terms of uh, the MFI sector and the financial services sector broadly? How do you see it coming out of this crisis? Yeah, so if you take, if I just step back uh, to the last 10 years, uh, the AP crisis brought out a regulatory transformation and the business model got transformed and the microfinance business got strengthened. That this was a sector that was written off uh, 10 years back, but the sector bounced back on the back of the interventions by RBI and the regulatory transformation and business model got transformed. Similarly, post demonetization, that was again a crisis. Uh, the microfinance sector uh, used the crisis to come out very strongly and also transformed uh, their organizations uh, uh, digitally in an accelerated manner. Right? I think this COVID uh, crisis, uh, I think hopefully, uh, the customers uh, will tra transform digitally. It's not, we had the model getting transformed and the company is becoming digital. I think hopefully we will expect to see uh, a lot of customers adopting uh, digital banking channels and, uh, uh, and the whole collection practices could change again, which will uh, hopefully strengthen the sector for the future. But the key thing, what we notice is the customers are very resilient always in each of these crises. So as long as the customer's livelihoods are protected, I think the organization serving the customers will come out of a crisis. If the underlying business is in trouble, then you know, a lender cannot uh, escape uh, part of the trouble. Yeah. Great, great. Good positive note, Jagdish. Alok, you, are, you have the last word. How do you see this, us coming out of this? Uh, uh, yeah, how uh, do you see IndiFi and uh, the situation panning out across uh, the yeah. globe? You know, I would not go to the extent of saying that we are going to come out of this crisis positive. This is a crisis. Uh, it is a crisis for customers. Hello, just a little louder. Uh, the, we can't hear you very clearly. Yeah, I was saying, uh, you know, I would not go to the extent of saying that any of us are going to come out positive out of this crisis, right? So this is a crisis for the customers. This is a crisis for us. I do think that there might be an opportunity to have better product design as we move forward, you know, in... Uh, in heady times, everything looks like credit and everything looks great uh, when it looks like credit, right? Uh, we are beginning to differentiate a little bit better now in terms of where is the credit need, where is the liquidity need, uh, can we design products that fit the customer's business better? So so I would love it if some of us uh, were able to make the transition. I would love it if Indifi started to offer more relevant products to its customers uh, as a result of these experiences. Okay. Uh, great. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. We had all uh, almost 190 attendees. Uh, now the number has come down to around 152. Uh, thank you for taking the time out and staying late in the night or early in the morning up wherever you are. And thank you to all the panelists. Just a short note, we will also be publishing a, a detailed note out of these webinar in, uh, interactions and we will send it out to all the panelists and the attendees. So do watch out for that. And we will also be putting up the recording of this uh, webinar up on our uh, communication channels. So thanks again. Thanks to all the panelists. Thanks to all the attendees. It was a really engaging and interesting talk. Uh, thanks for taking the time out. And stay safe and hope we come out of this crisis sooner. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Thank you.